Today we are going to review for your conceptual unit 1A test. All right, so first problem says the table shows the percentage of male and female populations in a certain county employed in the workforce in certain years since 1989. Model the data algebraically with linear equations of the form y equals mx plus b. Use the 1989 and 1995 data to complete the slopes. Use the year as x and the employment data as y. Well, what's going to happen is I did this with the graphing calculator. Okay, so I went to stat and I entered the year since 1989. So this would be 0, this would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So there's my x values. My women are going to be my L2 values. So I typed those in for L2 and my men data I typed in for L3 and then we want to calculate linear regressions because they said they want us to find linear equations. So if I go to stat and calc and I do lin regression, all right, and it gives me 3.2, so my equation would be y equals 3.2x plus 38.47 or 38.5 if we round it. Now if you notice that's different from their answer. So, and that's because they wanted us to do it by hand and they wanted us to use the 1989 and the 1995 data, which is this one and this one. So if I do this for females, the women, what you would do is your two ordered pairs for 1989 would be 0 comma 38.2 and for 1995, your ordered pair is 6, 57.5. So if you're doing this by hand, the first thing you have to do is calculate your slope, which is going to be y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So I'd have 38.2 minus 57.5 is negative 19.3 divided by negative 6, which gives me 3.21666 repeating, which is where they got the 3.22 for the slope. Then to get this B value, you look at basically, this is supposed to be your y-intercept. Well, that's at x equals 0, you get a y-intercept, so my y-intercept is 38.2, which means my equation is y equals 3.22x plus 38.2. Okay, so that's how you do that by hand. When I did the men, I did linear regression, but now for my y list, I had to pick L3. Yeah, make sure when you're doing a double stat problem, see how when I did my linear regression for the women, it took my x coordinates from L1 and my y coordinates from L2 because that's where I typed in the women data. When I do it again for the men, I've got to make sure they're pulling the y's from the L3 list because that's where the men data is. Okay, so make sure you do that. And then if I get my linear regression, I get negative 3.2 from my calculator. I get negative 3.2x plus 87.4. And you can see that we're a little bit off because, again, they wanted us to do that by hand. So for 1989 and men, my ordered pair would be 0, 87.7. And for 1995, my ordered pair would be 6, 68.4. So if I calculate my slope, it's going to be y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Wait a second, what did I use? Oh, okay. So I would get, so I did this minus this. Oh, so whoops. No, I did this y minus this y, so I got to do 6 minus 0. Yeah, you're right. All right, so I have, oops, 68.4 minus 87.7, and I get negative 19.3 divided by 6, and I get negative. 3.216 repeating, which gives me 
my slope of negative 3.22 if they round. And again, this is your zero, which is your y-intercept, so b is 87.7. So with that m and that b, my equation becomes y equals negative 3.22x plus 87.7. Okay? All right, so it says the height of the building of a building is 1,045 feet. How long will it take an object to fall to the ground from the top? It says use the formula S equals 16T squared, where S is the distance in feet traveled by an object falling freely from rest in T seconds. Okay, so what they're saying is S is the distance and T is time. Well, they're giving me a distance. The height of this building is 1,045 feet, and that's where you're dropping the object from. So they're telling you to make S 1045 equals 16t squared. To solve this, I'm going to divide by 16. So 1045 divided by 16, I get 65.3125 equals t squared. To get t, I'm going to square root, and t equals the square root of that is approximately 8.0816, blah, blah, blah. So my time would be approximately 8.1 seconds. Okay? All right. And I could just type it in, 16x squared. You can't use t because the calculator understands y and x. So I can plug that in, and then I can go find, look through my table until I get up to a height, I'm looking for 1045 in this column, which from 1 to 1 1.6, I didn't get there. So I went farther, and right here, there's 8.1, is 1049, there's 8.2, all right, and then there's 8, and so it's somewhere between here and here, and it was 8 point, what did we get, 8.0816, but we rounded it to 8.1. Okay. All right, so it says the number of revenue passengers in planes in a given region over the 10-year period from 1993 to 2002 is shown in this table. It says use 1993 as year zero, so this is going to be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And um, to answer the following, which of the following scatter plots model the data? Well, if I go to my stat and I enter in 0 through 9 for my L1 and these numbers for my L2, you're going to have to set your window. Um, I went from negative 2 to 10 because my x's only went to 9. And then my highest y value was 613.5 so I went from negative 5 and I went all the way to 615 and I counted by 20s and I get this picture well you're looking and you're going well that doesn't really look like any of mine or the choices well look at their windows but I can tell this one's coming down this one's going way down the only one that looks like it's following the right path would be B but you could change the window to what their window is. I, I got close. I went negative 2 to 10 and I went 400 to 615 because I wanted to go a little past there. And now you can see mine looks a little bit more like theirs. Okay. And then for the second part it says according to the algebraic model, so they've already did a quadratic regression on this scatter plot and they came up with this regression equation and it says when will the number of passengers reach 754 million? That's a y value, because x is time. So they're telling me to change the y, which is whatever's over here. Remember, this can be written using y and x. Is They use different letters just to so it's easier for you to go, this is how many people are complained, and um, t is time. Okay, but anyway, so we're trying to set this y coordinate to 754 million. Now, by hand, you would subtract 754, and I'd get 0 equals 2x squared minus 4.2x minus 45 minus 754 would be negative 269. 
And then you could do quadratic formula. Negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. That's one possibility. Or we can use a table. And so what I did was I went to y equals. I just kept my plot on so that I could see my dots. I typed in the, the function they gave me. Um, I didn't type in this one. I typed in this one. All right, and I want to see when it equals 754, which is approximately, <coughs> excuse me, 12.7 <clears throat> years. All right, so if I go 12.7 years, which is going to be approximately 13 years, if I go 13 years past 1993, that's going to be 2006. Okay? All right, solve this equation algebraically. You've got y squareds here, so I want to get the, well, let me write it again. So I got y squared minus 11 equals 8 minus 5y squared. <coughs> so sorry. All right, so to solve this algebraically, it's a second degree equation, so I want to get the second degrees together. So I'm going to add 5y squared, which gives me 6y squared minus 11 equals 8. So then I'm going to try and get y alone. So I'm going to add 11, and I get 6y squared equals 19. Then I'm going to divide by 6, and I get y squared equals 19 over 6. And then I'm going to, to kill the square, take the square root of both sides, which gives me y equals plus or minus the square root of 19 over 6. Okay? All right, so we're going to solve this equation graphically by converting it to an equivalent equation with 0 on the right-hand side and then finding the x-intercepts. So I need to get everything on the right-hand side. No, I'm sorry, get everything on the left-hand side. They want 0 on the right-hand side. So I have the square root of 19x plus 5 equals x plus 5. To get 0 on the right, I'm going to subtract x, and I'm going to subtract 5. That gives me 0 on the right. You can't subtract letters and numbers from radicals. So the only thing I can do is write this down. Square root of 19x plus 5 minus x minus 5 equals 0. Then, oops, you are going to solve this graphically. I guess I didn't read that. All right, give me just a second. Let me get my graphing calculator here. Hold on just a second. Let me get my calculator. All right, so if I go to y equals, clear out whatever's there, and I'm going to type in the square root of 19x minus 5, and then minus x minus 5, and if I graph that, Oops, that's plus 5. Let's try that. There we go. Okay, now remember we talked about that hidden behavior. I mean, I have an advantage because I can see the solution was 4, 5. All right, but let's switch our window. And usually when it's close like that, you want to switch your, your Y window to go really short. So I'm going to go negative 1 to 1 and count by 0.5s. Let's see what that does for me. Nope, still not looking at it very well. So let's go, and I'm going to go from negative 0.5 to 0.5. Nope, yeah, still can't really see it very well, can we? So let's go from, oops, negative 0.25 to 0.25 and count by 0.25s. 
All right, I can see it a little better. So anyway, we're going to do now second calc. And we're going to calculate zeros. So I want choice two. It's going to ask me for left bound, right bound. So let's see, I'm at zero. i find my cursor here. There it is. So my left bound would be about right there. Oops. Dang it. There it go. My right bound. I gotta wait till Y is a little bit positive. So I'm gonna hit enter there. And there's my one zero is four zero. Oops. And then I gotta calculate my other one. So second calc again. Zero again, but now my left bound is gonna be over here on the positive side where y is positive and then my left bound is going to be where y is negative and that one's at 5. So you can see my solutions are at x equals 4 and x equals 5. Okay? Alright, so it says solve this equation graphically by converting it to an equivalent equation with 0 on the right hand side and then finding the x-intercepts so if I have this x plus 5 to the negative first equals x to the negative first plus x, I'm going to move this over, so I'm going to minus x to the negative first, and I'm going to minus x. Again, that gives me my 0 over here. I can't, nothing is like terms, so I drop everything. x plus 5 to the negative first minus x to the negative first minus x. And if I type that in, Okay, and then I hit graph, alright, and let's write over everything I wrote, sorry about that. Alright, if I calculate this zero, I get approximately negative 5.185917, which is going to be negative 5.19. Okay. Alright, so it says determine whether the formula determines y as a function of x. This is a square root function. I can, I know, I don't know where it's at, I mean I can figure it out, but I know a square root function looks like this, that passes the vertical line test, so yeah. And you can see I graphed it. Now if you did the plus or minus, it wouldn't be a function, but if you just are talking about the positive one, then you're just talking about the first half, and yes. But if you were really talking about a square root function, which is plus or minus, that wouldn't pass. So be careful. Alright, this one says determine whether the formula determines y as a function of x. If I type this in and got y alone, because the calculator doesn't understand it, I'd take the sixth root, the sixth root, and I'd get y equals the sixth root of x. So if I type that in, and I gotta do plus or minus because I got y alone, and when you take an even root, it's plus or minus. It gives you this picture. It does not pass the vertical line test, so no, it's not a function. Okay, it says determine if this graph is a function. Well, it passes the vertical line test, so yes. This one does not pass the vertical line test, so no. Find the domain of the rational expression. Your domain, you have to check two things. You have to say, Mr. Denominators, you may never equal zero, and Mr. Radicals must always stay greater than or equal to zero. I don't have any radicals, so I don't have to worry about that. But I do have denominators, so I have to say, Mr. Denominator, you may never equal zero. And then if I solve that, that says x plus 5 can never equal zero, and the other one says x minus 7 may never equal zero. So this says x may never equal negative 5, and this says x may never equal 7. So in interval notation, if you look at that on a number line, that means you have to skip over negative 5, and you have to skip over 7, but all other values are cool. So my domain would go from negative infinity to negative 5, union, negative 5 to 7, union, 7 to infinity. Okay? And if you look, there's your negative 5 asymptote, and there's your 7 asymptote. Alright, so on this one, find the domain of the function algebraically and support your answer graphically. I've got all kinds of issues. I've got a Mr. Radical that must always stay positive, and I have a Mr. Denominator 
who may never equal zero. So a combination of all of these restrictions, if I solve for x here, I'm going to square square, and that says 4 minus x has to stay greater than or equal to zero. So minus 4 minus 4 negative x greater than or equal to negative 4. Divide by negative 1, divide by negative 1, which will flip your inequality. So what that says, you know what, let me change this. What that says is that 4, I can include it and keep anything to the left. So anything past that is out. So now let's look at my denominator restrictions, which says x plus 7 may never equal 0, and x squared plus 1 may never equal 0. This says x may never equal negative 7. This says x squared may never equal negative 1, square root, square root, and this may never equal plus or minus imaginary i. This is not a restriction because it's not even real. So my only other restriction is x cannot be negative 7. So at negative 7, I have to make a hole, which says, now my domain then is everywhere that there is, and, and for the 7, i got to jump there, but actually it could be everywhere else. Okay, so there's my, in blue is my denominator restriction, in green is my, oops, in green is my um, denominator restriction, and your domain is everywhere that there's green and blue. There's blue here, but not green, so no. There's green, there's blue, so yes. There's green, but not blue, so no. And in this section, there's green and blue, so yes. So my domain is going to be negative infinity to negative 7 union negative 7 to 4. And I can include the 4, so that 4 is going to get a square bracket instead of a round bracket. Okay? And you can see at negative 7, there's a gap, and then at 4, it just quits. It doesn't go beyond there. It can't, because anything there will give you error messages. All right, so find the range. When you're looking for range, look at the graph, okay? This thing, you're going from bottom to top. So I can do, yes, 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 yes. There's no more graph after this point. No. Yes, so my domain goes from negative infinity to negative 1, and it stops. And it includes negative 1, so it's square, and that one's going to be round. So my range goes from negative infinity to negative 1, and it includes the negative 1, so round bracket. Okay? All right, if I find the range of this function, you got a couple of things going on here. You've got, if you're looking bottom to top, you're going yes, 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 stop. So that would be negative infinity to negative 1. And then it starts again here, and it goes yes, 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 up. Well, that's 0 to infinity. So my range is negative infinity to negative 1 union 0 to infinity. Okay? All right, it says graph the function and tell whether it has a point of discontinuity at x equals 0. Tell whether any point of discontinuity is removable or non-removable. Well, I know that there's going to be a point of discontinuity whenever my denominator equals 0. So if I say, Mr. Denominator, you may never equal 0, that tells me that, yes, there's a point of discontinuity. So, yeah, there is. And it says, is the point of discontinuity at x equals 0 removable or non-removable? It will be removable if it cancels with a factor on top. And it doesn't. I can't, um, I can't uh, cancel an absolute value of x with an x. Okay, so it doesn't cancel, which means it's going to be non-removable. All right, and if you look at it, then there's the graph. All right, so it says identify local extrema and intervals on which the function is decreasing and increasing. So it says choose the best description for the point negative 4, negative 1. And it looks like that they're counting by, and I don't, I don't, the graphs on math Excel, they don't really give you the scale very well, but 
I'm assuming that they're counting by twos. All right. So if we've got negative four, I don't know what they're counting by here, but looks like that's negative one, I'm assuming. And that would be a local maximum. All right, the point at zero, negative 17, I'm assuming it has to be this point. So, which has, look at, look, there's a point of discontinuity there. So there's a dot there. I don't, can't tell if it's connected or not. Well, I don't, I don't know what they're counting by. This is terrible. I mean, if that's 17, well, if that's 1, that's got to be at least 5, 10, 15, 17. So I'm, I'm assuming maybe they're going, I don't know, if they're going by 5s, that would be that point, which would be neither a maximum nor a minimum. And if it's that point, it's neither a maximum or a minimum either because it's in the middle. This would be your local min. That would be your local max. So it says choose the best description for the point 4, negative 35, which I'm going to assume if we're counting by 2s, that's 4. And then again, well, that must be 10, 20, no, 15, 30, I don't know what they're counting by. Anyway, if they're talking about that point, that would be a local minimum. All right, and then it says on which intervals is the function increasing? Well, it's coming up until this point, and then it's also going up at this point. So it's going from negative infinity to negative 4. And then from this point, it's going 4 to infinity. Decreasing would be, change colors. Decreasing would be this section here, which would be from negative 4 to positive 4. Okay? All right, it says graph the following function. I know, I mean, you can type it in the graphing calculator if you want to, but I know that mother is the V in the middle, and this is going to move it 3 to the right, and this is going to move it 3 up. So your V is going to be up here like this somewhere, which is that one. And we would say it's decreasing, and that was at 3. So it's decreasing from negative infinity to 3, and then it's increasing from 3 to infinity. Okay, and if I graphed it, you can see it that way. All right, graph the function and identify intervals on which the function is increasing, decreasing, or constant. If I type that in, I get this function, or I get this picture, okay? So they want increasing first. Well, it's increasing here, which is from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to infinity. They want the decreasing interval, which is this interval, which is negative infinity to this point, which is negative 4. And then they want the constant, which is in the middle, which would be negative 4 to 5. Okay? All right, determine whether the function is bounded above, bounded below, or bounded on its domain. You've got to look at the picture. This thing is bounded above because there's no graph higher than that point. It's not, if I try and say it doesn't go past there, I'm lying because that will break on through. That goes forever and ever. So we say it's bounded above. Use a grapher to find all local maxima and minima and the values of x where they occur. So if I graph it, it says they want local maxima. There is no local maxima because those go forever and ever. The local minima, if I calculate minimum, okay, my x-coordinate is at 0.5, and my minimum value is actually negative 3.25. So we say it's y equals negative 3.25 at x equals 0.5, and that will be your local mean. Okay, use a graphing calculator, estimate the local maximum and minimum of this polynomial function. If I type it in, I graph it. Okay, if I find the value of the local maximum, okay, that would be right there, left bound, right bound, and I get my 
maximum when x is negative 0 0.707, my maximum value is 2.707. My local min, my local min is going to be somewhere around in there. Alright, and so if I calculate that, that is going to be at 0 0.7071 blah 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 and the maximum value or minimum is actually 1.293. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to find where my little arrows went. can't see my arrows. All right, find the vertical and horizontal asymptotes, then graph the function. To find your vertical asymptotes, you set your denominator equal to zero, which is going to be at x equals four. Two, three, four, you can see the vertical asymptote. My horizontal asymptotes, you look at the degree rules. My top degree is one. My bottom degree is one. When it's a tie, that means your horizontal asymptote is at TLC divided by BLC. The top leading coefficient, the number touching x to the first is 3. The bottom leading coefficient, the number touching x on the bottom is 1. So my horizontal asymptote is going to be at y equals 3. And you can see right there, there's my horizontal asymptote. And then type it in the graphing calculator and get the picture. Okay. I want to see if I skipped anything. I did. I did. No, I got that one. Okay. All right, I skipped 22, so sorry. All right, on this one, guys, you can type it in the graphing calculator, or you can just look at the degrees. This is even, this is even, this is odd. You have some of each, it's neither. If they're all even, it's even. If they're all odd, it's odd. If there's some of each, it's neither. Okay? In most cases. <laughs> yeah, and if you look at it, if you look at the picture of it, right, it doesn't, the y-axis doesn't, I mean, it doesn't, there's no symmetry there. This side doesn't look like this side. The top doesn't look like the bottom. And the diagonal doesn't look like the diagonal, so there's no symmetry to it. All right, we did that one. All right, 24. It says, use a method of your choice to find all horizontal and vertical asymptotes of the function. Method of your choice means you could do it by looking at the graph, or you could do it algebraically. I like algebraically. Your vertical asymptotes are when Mr. Denominator equals 0. So if I add x, I get a vertical asymptote at x equals 3. Now everybody says, but miss, x can equal 3. You're right. If you're finding domain, we're talking about two different things that are very closely related. If you're talking about domain, you're saying x can't equal 3. If you're talking about vertical asymptotes, that's why there's an asymptote there, because x can't be 3 in the function. So when x is 3, that's when you get that vertical asymptote. Notice, there's at 3, it's, there's no graph. It jumps over 3 because x can't be 3. Okay, your horizontal asymptotes, we're going to use our degree rules. My top degree is 1. My bottom degree is 1. They're equal, so my horizontal asymptote is top leading coefficient by bottom leading coefficient. My top leading coefficient is 1. My bottom leading coefficient is negative 1. So y equals negative 1. And you can see right there, there's that asymptote. Okay. The graph to the right is a variation of one of these functions, either the identity function, the squaring function, the cubing function, or the reciprocal function. It's a line. So it's got to be this. Those are out. And then you got to look at what they did. Well, mother goes right through the origin. And it looks like all they did was move it two up. So identity is y equals x, and if they want to move it, oh, they moved it left 2, which works also. You could go left 2. You could also go up 2. Lines are funny. 
Okay, so this line went left two, so we'd add two. All right, choose which of the functions is an odd function. An odd function, this is even, because this side, if you fold it, it looks like this side. This function is actually neither, because if I folded it over, oh no, it is even. It is, that one's even too. Odd either means that the top reflects the bottom or you have this reflection diagonally. That's an odd function. All right, it says identify which of the 12 basic functions fit the description given below. The functions that do not have end behavior, x approaches positive infinity, the function approaches positive infinity. What that means is as you go further and further this way, as x gets increasingly bigger, they're saying the function does this. And they want to know the functions that do not do that. So I'm looking for functions that on this side of x are coming down and not up. This one's going up. This one's going up. This one's oscillating. This one's going up. This is coming down. So I want that one. Going up? No. Going up? No. Going up? No. Going up? No. Oscillating? No. Going up? No. Horizontaling out. So the only one would be the 1 over x. Oh, and they're saying that this one is 2. Oh, well, you're right. I guess it's not going up. It's, it's actually going to, it's not going down either, but it's not going to go up and up forever. It's going to actually level out. Okay. All right, so let's find the domain and range of the ln of x plus 4 using the graph. If I look at the graph, again, trying to figure out what the heck they're counting by, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, I'm assuming negative 4, but that's because I can see the answer. All right, so I can tell that for my domain, it goes from negative, it doesn't include negative 4, because this isn't actually going to touch it, so it's round bracket, negative 4 to infinity. My range, this thing continues down forever, and this is going up forever, so my range would be negative infinity to infinity. All right, the graph of the function is shown on the grid. Absolute value of x plus 3. On what interval is the function increasing? That would be from 0 to infinity. On what interval is the function decreasing? That would be negative infinity to 0. It's an even function because this half mirrors that half. And the local minimum would be right there, which is at 0, 3. Okay. Sketch a graph of the piecewise function. State whether the function is continuous at x equals 0. What I do on this is, I think, did I do it on the computer? Yeah, I did. Okay, so I typed in e to the x first, all right, which is going to be this function right here. But they want it for x is less than or equal to 0. So I only want this much of it. I don't want any of that. Okay, and then they want ln x if x is greater than 0. Well, all of ln of x is greater than 0. So I want everything except for this part that I squished out, which would be that one. And is it continuous at x equals 0? Um, no, because there's a gap there. Okay. And if you look, here's the other way you can tell. If it's continuous at 0, if I look at the table, see how I get an error message there? Right? And it's because if you try and do ln of 0, you, for, for e to the x, it's defined. It's 1. But for ln of x, that's not defined. So there's a point of discontinuity there. All right, it says find the formulas for the functions f plus g, f minus g, f times g, and give the domain of each. So if I have f plus g of x, that's going to be the f function plus the g function. I can't simplify any farther than that. There's no drama. There's no denominators. There's no radicals. So my domain would be negative infinity to infinity. All right. F minus g, I'm going to have x squared minus 7x minus 9. This one is going to change because of subtraction. And that's going to be x squared minus 7x plus 9. There's my difference. 
Again, no drama, no denominators, no radicals, so my domain is negative infinity to infinity. F times G would be X squared times 7X minus 9. Distribute. That gives me 7X cubed minus 9X squared. Again, no drama, so my domain is negative infinity to infinity. Okay. Alright, 32, find the formula for F divided by G and G divided by F. If I do F divided by G, I put my F function, which is the square root of X plus 6, over my G function is X cubed. My domain, I've got drama. Okay? First, I have Mr. Radical, you must always stay positive, and Mr. Denominator, you may never equal 0. So if I solve this one, square, square, I get x plus 6 greater than or equal to 0, so x has to be greater than or equal to negative 6. Take the cube root here, cube root, and x cannot equal 0. So if I look at that on the number line, my radical says I can include negative 6 and go to the right. That means all of these numbers are included. My dom uh, denominator drama says, except at zero, my denominator says at zero I have to skip zero. And I could be everywhere else. Alright, so my final domain is where there's both green and purple. Nope. And nope. So it's from negative six to zero, and I'm including the negative six. Union, zero to infinity. Okay? If I do g divided by x, g divi I mean g divided by f of x, I put the g function on top and the f function on bottom. And now for my domain here, I only have one drama, which is Mr. Radical, you must always stay positive. Square, square, x plus 6 must always remain greater than 0, so x has to stay greater than or equal to negative 6. And that's my only drama. So my domain would be negative 6 to infinity. Okay? Alright, they want me to find f of g of 2 and g of f of 2. If I find f of g of 2, I start with g of 2, which says change your x's to 2. Okay? That gives me 4 plus 2 gives me ahead of myself there, gives me 6, which is what they want me now to take to the f function. I know what g of 2 is. g of 2 is 6, so I replace that with 6. I go to the f function, which says 3 times what you brought, minus 1. I brought a 6. That's 18 minus 1, which is 17. Okay, and that would be f of g of 2. Then they want me to find g of f of 2. So that means I start by finding f of 2, which is 3 times what you brought, minus 1. I brought a 2. That's 6 minus 1 is 5. That I'm now, so I know what f of 2 is. It's 5. So now I'm taking 5 to the g party, which says square what you brought and add 2. I brought 5, squared is 25, plus 2 is 27. So g of f of 2 equals 27. Okay? Alright, find f of g of x and g of f of x and state the domain. If I'm going to do f of g of x, I'm starting with the g function which is x minus 4. Got it, and I'm going to take it to f. So I'm going to go to the f function and plug in x minus 4, which says 2 times what you brought, plus 5. I brought x minus 4. Simplify, that's 2x minus 8 plus 5. That's 2x minus 3. Okay, in your domain, there's no drama, there's no radicals, there's no fractions with letters in the denominator. So your domain is going to be all real numbers. All right.
to find g of f of x, I start with the f function, which says 2x plus 5, and I'm going to take that to g. So I'm going to find g of 2x plus 5. g says whatever you brought, subtract 4 from it. I brought 2x plus 5, so that gives me 2x plus 5 minus 4, which gives me 2x plus 1. g of f of x equals 2x plus 1. Again, no drama. So your domain is negative infinity to infinity. Alright, they want f of g of x and g of f of x. So, let's see, if I do f of g of x, this says start with the g function, which is x squared minus 5, and take it to f. So I'm going to find f of x squared minus 5. f says whatever you brought, square root of whatever you brought, plus 5. I brought x squared minus 5. Those cancel. The square root of x squared is not just x. Remember, if these are even in cancel, it's the absolute value of x. If I find, lost it again. If I find g of f of x, this says start with the f function, which is the square root of x plus 5, and take it to g. So if I take it to g, Sorry, I can't switch colors. I'm finding g of the square root of x plus 5, which my g function says whatever you brought, square it and subtract 5. I brought the square root of x plus 5. The square kills the square root. That gives me x plus 5 minus 5, which gives me x. And the domain of f of g is uh, negative infinity to infinity. Oh, because you have to find you have to find the domain of G, which is nothing, and then you find so you have why is that restricted? Hmm. Anyway, the domain of G of F if I take the function of f, or take the domain of f, which says, Mr. Radical, you must always stay positive, square, square, x plus 5 greater than or equal to 0, so x has to stay greater than or equal to negative 5. And if I do that, my domain starts at negative 5 and goes to infinity. Alright, for the given function, find f of g of x and g of f of x. If I find f of g of x, I'm starting with my g function, which is 1 over x, and I'm taking it to f. I can't switch colors, dang it. So I'm finding f of 1 over x. That would be 6 over 1 minus seven times whatever I brought. Oh, I can't switch colors. And I brought one over x. So this is going to be six over one minus seven over x. I need a common denominator, which is going to be x over x. Alright, my common denominator is going to be x, so multiply by x, multiply by x, you get x over x. So that gives me 6 over x minus 7 over x. Keep, change, flip. Keep the 6, change the times, flip the bottom, so it's x over x minus 7. And then multiply straight across would give me 6x over x minus 7. Okay? So now what you have to do is you have to say, well, and when you were doing f of g, the g, you always take the second one, the one that's inside, and you get its domain, which says x can never equal 0. And this says that x can never equal 7. So if I have to not include 0 and not include 7,
but I can include everything else. My domain is going to be negative infinity to zero, union zero to seven, union seven to infinity. All right, if I do g of f of x, I start with my f function, which says six over one minus seven x, and I take it to uh, g. So I'm finding g of six over one minus seven x. My g function says one over, instead of x, I'm gonna put this mess, which is six over one minus seven x. Keep, change, flip. Keep the one, change the times, flip the fraction on the bottom, and I get one minus seven x over six. Now, to get the domain for this guy, you have to find your domain of the inside first. And that domain says, uh, Mr. Denominator, you may never equal zero. So, minus one, minus one, negative seven x can never equal negative one. So, x can never equal positive one seven. And then I look at my domain of g, all right, which, it, or my, my composition, there's no drama here. Yeah, there's a denominator, but there's no variable in it. So my only domain restriction is x can't equal 1 7. Well, if x can't equal 1 7, but it can equal everything else, my domain is negative infinity to 1 7, union 1 7 to infinity. All right. 37, it says find f of x and g of x so that the function can be described as y equals f of g of x. They're telling you to decompose the function. And remember, whatever's inside is your g function, and then whatever the function is, the mother function, which this one is absolute value, is your f function. Alright, it says my, again, same thing here. This would be whatever whatever's inside is your g function, so x minus 2. And then just switch that back to an x, and that would be your f function. And a satellite camera takes a rectangle-shaped picture. The smallest region that can be photographed is a 3 by 5 rectangle, which has an area of 15. As the camera zooms out, the length L and W are increasing at a rate of 2 kilometers per second. So my length was 5, but now it's growing by 2x. My width was 3, but now it's growing by 2x. And they want my area to be 5 times its original size. Well, 5 times 15 uh, would be 75. Yeah? So what I want to know is, how long will it take for the area? Well, area is length times width. I want to know, when is the area going to be 75 if my length is 5 plus 2x and my width is 3 plus 2x? You could do this by hand, get, foil everything out, get 0 on one side and do a quadratic formula. Or you can do, remember how we said we can solve anything, we can call this side y1 and this side y2. So I typed in that for y1, that for y2, set my window to go as high as 75. And then I calculated, there's two intersection points. This one doesn't make any sense because that would represent negative time. So I just calculate this intersection point and I get an area of 75 when time is two point, approximately 2.4 seconds. Well, read Ms. Hamilton. Two, they told you round to the nearest hundredth. So it would be 2.36. Alright. So, happy studying. And we'll see you.